TFM. Welcome, stargazers, to another episode of the Artificial Tango, our dedicated Star Trek Picard podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host Matthew Rushing. And Matthew, we're recording this on May the Fourth, and we might be talking about Star Trek. But I see from your shirt that the Fourth <laughs> and the Fourth are with you today. That's it's very true. Um, it's funny because obviously for you is May the fourth, yeah. But for me, it is still May third. That's so right. That's right. I like you know how you got to jump on things. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure you'll probably be Star Warsing it up today. Uh, so which is very fun. But I will just say here, I am sorry, everyone. I'm feeling a little under the weather, so you might hear that in my voice uh, today. But. I couldn't miss talking about Star Trek Picard with Chris. We're going to dive into the penultimate episode of season two of Star Trek Picard, which, you know, uh, Chris, apparently they should have just had us as writers because, well, we pretty much (laughs) called everything. You know, it it is interesting (laughs) how close we have been on some of these plot points. And it's not that I think the writing was bad like it was on the first season oh, of Star Trek Discovery. But I think that the story itself here is so focused on what's happening internally with these characters that especially if you've had some of these experiences yourself with family and loved ones and such, it is a bit easy to imagine where the story is headed. No, I I think you're 100% right there. But I also think that just the season itself was very focused. You know, there were not any tangential threads that got lost. And so they were very specific in what they were trying to do with with these characters. And and Mm -hmm. thematically, the whole thing has revolved around people figuring out themselves finally. You know, from Picard to Seven to the Borg Queen to... All of these people, and uh, I think, to me, it, it wasn't the fact that it was, you know, bad writing or anything like that or easy to figure out. It was just, you know, if you're paying attention to wh- what they were doing in the writing, you could kind of extrapolate where they were going to go, which, you know, I, I think is an interesting thing, and I have no issues with that. I think it's great that this has really been such a focused season, and it, it really turned things around. Yeah. From season one. So yeah. it's to me, it's it's been phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of those points you brought up there, because there's a lot that happens in this episode as, as everything is coming together. So here's a quick rundown of Star Trek Picard season two, episode nine, Hide and Seek. On a stormy night in France, the storylines converge as Jean-Luc relives the events leading up to his mother's death. And faces what really happened. Seven and Raffi also face death as the Borg Queen takes the La Serena, but are spared as the power of Agnes overtakes that of the Borg Queen and leads to a new, more compassionate future for the collective. Soong is also in on the action as Brent Spiner once again leads a group of Borg, and Elnor finds another chance for some screen time despite being dead. It's a dark episode in many ways, but it ends with a glimmer of hope. And Matthew, I think maybe that's where we'll get to in our discussion today. It feels like the season's been building towards this darkness. And finally, everything's revealed about what happened with Picard's mother, which we can talk about as our first point here. But I did want to say that when we get to the very end of this, I do feel like we get that glimmer of hope. We we get that look towards an optimistic future, and it comes in an unexpected package, being mm-hmm. the board queen, who I think yeah. most strongly delivers that message. But why don't we start with Picard's mother, because everything has played out as we predicted. I remember, how many episodes ago was it on here? Three, four, or more, when you said that you would bet real money that Picard opened that door and let his mother out, and then she took her own life. And yep, that's exactly what happened. 
What I think is so interesting about the storyline is the way in which the traumatic nature of what happens to Jean-Luc, you can absolutely see why this has driven him and to do all the things that he's done. So in some Mm -hmm. ways, it's had an incredible impact on him in the sense of, of what he's been able to accomplish. And yet, it has also kept him from being able to live a full life. And I really appreciated that, you know, we finally get to that moment where Talon says, follow it, the memory. And we really see Picard finally come to grips with the memory that he has tried to suppress for his entire life. And by facing it, he now can move forward in a, in a way that he was never going to be able to before. And, you know, I, I think one of the things to me is it's a little bit sad that it's taken Picard this long to get to this point. Almost his entire and, life because yeah. he is going to age as an android, but it's his normal lifespan. So he's got, what, maybe 20 more years. Right, right. And, and you know, I mean, they still have medical technology that I think, mm-hmm. you know, could allow him to live even longer. It's the you know, 25th century. But, yeah, I mean, and, and one of the things that I think thematically this does, I think, for the audience is, is to remind us to not wait to deal with emotional trauma. Yeah. You know, to not wait to... to uh, deal with the things that have happened, uh, you know, that we all deal with it, the, th- the things that have happened in our lives and, and to spend time looking into that. And the longer we wait, the harder it is. And not only is it harder, <laughs> but um, it's, it's something too that in all honesty, you know, we see Picard spend so much of his life trying to cover over this and it leads to kind of a half-life for him. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, and obviously that's what I think is beautiful is that that's a theme that plays through for everybody. Again, especially with, I think with, with Seven of Nine. So, and her coming to grips with who she is. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, this is just a, it, it's a, it's a really sad story. But like I think you said, especially even with this story, there is hope because Picard has finally dealt with this issue and now he can finally move on and it will be a part of him in a completely different way, which is great. Yeah, I I think it explains a lot, too, about the Picard family themselves it was interesting after this episode aired. Yeah, I, I try to avoid too much, consuming too much comment or discussion about these episodes before we talk about them because I, I want it to be my thoughts. I don't want to be colored too much by what's going on. But of course, I use Twitter for work and for research and for all sorts of things. And so I did notice a little bit of outrage after this episode about Robert and people are asking where the hell was Robert when his mother was killing himself. And that was actually established in the first episode. He's at boarding school. That's why he's not there to deal with it. But what I I think is sort of interesting, if you look at the sadness now, of course, it's Picard's memory, but the sadness of Morris when he's talking to his son, as an adult in that counseling session. And also his demeanor that you see when he's interacting with young Jean-Luc and with his wife. And then if you think about the family dynamic of the Picard family, as we saw it in The Next Generation, there always seemed to be some like a disjointed nature, animosity within the family And the fact that all of this happened, and maybe even for Robert, the fact that he couldn't be there when his mother was going through this, also uh, created perhaps a similar feeling in him as what we've seen from Jean-Luc here. And then later, when he and his son 
Rene die in the fire, which we see in Generations, and we see Jean-Luc's reaction to that. I think that this whole thing centering around their mother, Yvette Picard, really colored the dynamic of that family for years and years to come. And now that Jean-Luc has faced what really happened and can let go of that, I'm wondering how this is going to play into the finale and how he might be able to help Rene, who's going on the Europa mission, overcome her own mental struggles that we've seen her deal with, which sort of mirror that of his mother. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think you did a great job of kind of breaking down the way this really connects with everything that we've seen with the Picard family. I think really, really well. You know, it it also makes sense why the underlying issues with Robert, you know, especially in family, you know, Picard himself, uh, you know, Jean-Luc kind of abandoning the family as Robert feels that, you know, he's he's gone off to the stars, he never comes mm-hmm. home, and I think this makes that so much deeper. It explains uh, than a we lot. ever thought. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know if we ever thought that would be possible. And and so I, I think you know, it's interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about on the orb how taking things that we use in the next generation and kind of giving them a lot more depth. And I think that's one of the things here when Picard uh, does some Uh, really nice things to give us a lot more depth with this character so that now when you go back to watch to the next generation, I I think that's going to impact the way that we see this character in a really good way, which is fantastic. I mean, that's if you're going to do this type of show, you do want it to retroactively in a good way, change the way you view the character there. Right. Um, And so I think that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 I think it does that quite well. Reminds me a little bit of how when you watch the early seasons of DS9 before the revelation of Bashir's enhancements, when you go back and you watch those earlier episodes, Mm -hmm. you see the character in a different way, right? And Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. It will be interesting to go back and watch the next generation again after the season of Picard and just look for those moments where you're able to read something new into what you're watching, into something that you've probably watched 50 times or 100 times over the years, and you can read something new into it because of the story that we're getting here. Yeah. So that's what's happened with Picard's mother. I, Before we leave this part, I thought that what she said to him when they were in the tunnels about the vastness of space and how long it takes light to travel and how the brilliance you see in the night sky, the exquisite light, it's just an echo of a star that has long since faded. And then she says, like me. There's also that moment in the same moment. She says, when you remember me, Jean-Luc, promise me that you'll ignore the coldness of the dying star and remember instead her light and the infinite love she so very much had for you. And in that moment, I felt like she's revealing that she's planning to take her own life. Although it could be read as simply, when you're older, when you remember me, think back to this. But it it felt like a revelation that at his age, he couldn't quite comprehend what she was saying to him. And in this story, we do see him protesting in his own way as a child, trying to discourage her, but he couldn't really do that much as a child other than to try to protest, try to keep her there, try to tell her that, you know, father has said, I can't go down there. But then we get to the end and he does reveal that, you know, he did open the door. So I thought that the the writing here, what she says, I thought was, I thought it was well done. I thought it was impactful, at least for me. 
And again, I think I mentioned this. I don't know if I mentioned it on this show or not. I don't know if people know, and, and it is applicable to the story. My father took his own life about 10 years ago, and it was a, a really shocking moment for me that has taken me you know, most of a decade to get over and to come to terms with. So this story is actually quite close to home for me. It's interesting because the viewpoint that she has, I think, has a, a good thread of nihilism in it. And um, it makes sense, I think, that she ends up where she does, because I think in many ways, nihilism just, you, you know, that's where it leads when you have absolutely no hope. And so I will, and I think you made a great point earlier, and I'm really interested to see how this will then impact the way Jean-Luc can discuss things with Rene and what he might be able to do to lead her past her own melancholy Mm -hmm. and what kind of hope he might be able to give her in light of what he has been through. So I I think that to me is, is really fascinating because again, I think there for her even might maybe, um, you know, and I wonder if, you know, for a lot of people who, you know, who have this type of depression if it's not something that has to do with a kind of um, feeling like there is no hope and therefore um, a more nihilistic view of the world. Yeah, it was just really interesting to see that play out with his mother because she genuinely, she can't seem to find hope. Mm -hmm. She can't seem to find it in herself to hold on to anything. And it, it's, it's again, it's, it's such a sad scene, but I, I think, you know, I, I love that we finally get to the end of this part of the story so that now John Luke can move forward with Renee and hopefully with, uh, you know, a, a relationship in his life as well. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, Borg part of the story, the Queen Agnes and a new collective. This certainly seems to be playing out exactly as we've been predicting here, all the way down to the point now of the Borg asking to join the Federation when they come through the rift at the beginning of the Stargazer. Because that's what we get to here with Agnes is that she tells the Borg Queen, what if we ask What if we give a choice? What if we try to help others, offer a second chance? And so now all of this part of the story has come full circle for me and, and makes sense. And I don't know if we'll get much of this part of the story in the finale because there's so much to wrap up still with the other elements. And now the queen and her drones have left in the La Serena. They've flown away, although we might see them again here. But what did you think about how this all played out, how Agnes actually turned out to be stronger than the Borg Queen, because really it's Agnes who determines the final outcome of this struggle, whereas it seemed, especially early in the episode, like the Borg Queen had the upper hand. I thought that this was really interesting. And I, I thought that Allison Pill does a great job on both sides, you know, playing yeah. the Borg Queen and then kind of playing at the Agnes. And what I thought was really interesting is is the way in which that I felt like this did connect with the storyline for John Luke's mother in the sense that John Luke's mother didn't know what was best for her. And the Borg Queen doesn't know what's best for her. Right. Because she's yep. willing to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again in many different universes. And it always ends the same way that the Borg come to an end. And I, the the idea of and I think that this is so relevant, the idea that we give people a choice. We don't force people to join us. Right. And that free will 
section here, I think is so important within Star Trek. And I also think it's just really important to the storyline of, of somebody finally helping her see that the Borg could be so much more, especially mm-hmm. if there are uh, people who willingly join. And I love when Agnes is like, let's make a universe of sevens. Yeah. Putting the best of what it meant to be Borg and the best of what it meant to be human together and utilizing both for the betterment of her friends and the Federation. And I, I thought this was really, really cool. And obviously something that we have been looking forward to, you know, I, I think you had rightly called that many times that this is where we were headed with this. And I, I think with Picard, this makes sense that we would finally find a different way for the Borg. And I'm fascinated to see where this goes. Is this part of what we'll see in season three? All of that kind of stuff. I, I think it's it's going to be awesome in that way. So I thought this was really well done. Yeah, I am curious to see if this is the end of the story. Because I think I said a few episodes of the Artificial Tango back that maybe this is going to be the end of the storyline for Allison Peel's character for Agnes, where she becomes the Borg Queen and then she moves on. But I don't know. I'm starting to wonder if this is the launching pad for the third season and the reunion of the TNG crew is to help Picard with one final confrontation with the Borg. Now, the problem with that is that it doesn't seem like they're setting up a confrontation per se, because it seems like this collective is going to be one built on cooperation and embracing right uniqueness. And maybe there's another foe out there. Maybe they'll work together with this Borg. I don't know. I haven't given it much thought yet to where that might be going, but it it seems as uh, Ellie said in co- contact, it seems like an awful waste if they build all this up and then we don't get anything else from it. So maybe there's going to be more to it. I don't know. Where where do you think it might be headed? I think that's a a good question because I'm not sure, Mm -hmm. you know, is, is this going to be, you know, with a season three, would you have the Borg being integrated into uh, the Federation in some way? Do we have that happen a little bit at the end of season two here? You know, do we are we going to end up back at that moment on the Stargazer? I think we might end up back at that moment because yeah. it would be, you know, a great way to tie it all up. And I I think they have opened up a lot of really interesting doors, which is which is great. And so it leads me to just be kind of excited where they can go next with you know the Borg and with this character and in relation to season three and and the TNG crew being back um Mm -hmm. so I I think I think it's they have given us a lot to be able to chew on which is fantastic Mm -hmm. and like you said will we see them you know this part of the story at all in the last episode or is it something that ends up waiting for season three i'm Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to find that out i'm also (laughs) really interested actually just to see kind of how long the final episode is because it does feel like they have a lot to do yeah i've been wondering about that as well and there have been cases where we've had stories like this where we think that god they're going to need so much time to wrap this up and then it's a normal length episode and Sometimes it works okay. Sometimes it feels rushed. We'll see. As far as the Borg being in the the final episode, I do think that we'll probably end up back at that moment. And so we'll probably get this part of the story a little bit there. I think primarily, though, the finale is going to have to focus on Rene. It's going to have to focus on the Europa mission. Q is going to have to come back into it because we didn't get any Q in this episode. And... That also makes me wonder where the Soong element is going. 
So if we transition for a moment to the Soong element, and as part of that transition, I want to point out how visually striking it was that Brent Spiner was leading a group of Borg. Again, it reminded me of Lore and then Data joining him in Descent, where they have the drones behind them. And it seems like in all universes, in infinite timelines, Brent Spiner is destined to lead a group of Borg drones. Yeah, he just can't get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you think about Soong's part in this story? And do you you think that's heading anywhere in the finale? Like, what what is his role going to be in the end of the "Let's stop Renee from going on the Europa mission" story? Mm-hmm. I this is a really interesting question because I'm not sure exactly how this is all going to play out. I mean, this is the part of the story I think to me that has has felt a little less predictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so. I don't really know what they're trying to do yet, but, you know, Soong is an important character in the way that he connects with so much else in Star Trek. And so I am really wondering how we wrap this up for him, especially with Corey. Where does that come into it as well? You know, I, I just don't know. that. Again, I, I do feel like this might have been the, the storyline that has been the one I have not, it's not like I haven't felt comfortable with, but I just don't know where it's going. Like I, I well, so l- let me ask you this about the storyline, because I feel like this at times. Do you feel like this is a storyline that even needs to be in the season at all? Is it just put there so that Brent Spiner can be in the story? Like they've tied it in enough that it makes sense. But if you pulled this out of the storyline for season two, I feel like the story would still hold together just fine. I do think uh, I I could totally see that. Uh, I you know I I did think that the last episode did a good job of kind of bringing all the storylines together really well. Yeah. So I I think. For this storyline, it is going to all be about the finish. And I have faith that they will be able to bring it all together. You know, uh, last episode really did a great job of bringing a lot of things together uh, in a way that I didn't necessarily think possible. And so I'm thinking that they can they can do that as well with this, this final episode, which... Uh, I, I mean, I th- I feel like this season the writers have really earned our trust so far. Mm-hmm. I'll say one way in which the Soong storyline in this episode, I think, benefits and strengthens the story is that it gives us in the tunnels two struggles playing out at different stages of Picard's life in the same setting. So he's reliving those memories of his life as a child in the tunnels and we're watching it as if it's actually happening in the moment. And that's one struggle when he's young, where he feels trapped in these tunnels and helpless. And then as an adult here, they're trying to make their way to the other side of the vineyard so that they can hopefully retake the ship. And they're being pursued by Soong and these Borg drones through these tunnels And so it's, they're like, these are two struggles playing out in the same setting at extreme stages of Picard's life. And so I think that the Soong element here sort of strengthens the mother element of the story. And we see maybe a bit of contrast with Jean-Luc about his helplessness as a child and his confidence that he can overcome situations as an adult no i think that's a great point and i think uh, again this is one of the places where the last episode this episode we're really doing uh you know obviously we're wrapping up the season so we're putting stories to bed and you know uh, they they wrap up the storyline with his mother and with him in that sense 
but they still have this one more mission. And Tsung is going to be a part of trying to keep that from happening, Mm -hmm. which I think is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And and I'm kind of glad in some ways that I don't necessarily have a feeling of how that's going to work out, you know, like so many of the other places that I did. And, you know, they turned out to be correct, but it's kind of nice to be like, oh, man, I just don't know what's going to happen. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah. it makes it, uh, you know, feel like it'll be fun to watch the the finale to see how they do wrap this all up. Yeah. Well, the Soong part of the story also gives us the action for Rios. So we get some time with Rios and Teresa back at Talon's apartment. And then Rios is able to get over there and rejoin his friends. So let's talk a little bit about Rios and, again, where we think that story might be going. We talked the past couple of episodes about Rios's voyage home, and we're wondering what's going to happen with Teresa and Ricardo, and would he take them to the future? And I think that's still not clear. I think uh, Teresa made a lot about him leaving in this episode and how she'll have to let him go, which makes me feel like probably that's not what's going to happen and that probably she's going to go with him. I think that the storyline has been really interesting because obviously him, you know, falling for somebody in the 21st century and everything that she's kind of learned about what the future is like. It does feel like they are going with, you know, a a voyage home type of feel. And I'll be really interested. I mean, do they pull that trigger or do they allow her to stay back in the past? Which I, I think... I honestly think they might just because he's, you know, when he said, I'm trying to save your future. I'm trying to save your now. Yeah. And I think as close as they've become, Rios, I think, does recognize that this is where she belongs. So I I don't know. I'm, I'm really torn as to where they might go with this because the I think the easy thing to do is to go the voyage home route. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's necessarily the best route. You know? Like, I, I don't know if I would actually be excited about that. Well, no, I wouldn't be excited about it. I think that I would like to see a less expected resolution to it i suppose i th- i think that i've in modern star trek i've come to expect the writers to take the easy route most of the time which is one reason when i see this happening i feel like it's a setup for her to go because she's talking so much about having to give him up but we'll see now here's an idea maybe she is going to become like Starling in Future's End, and she's going to be left behind with this advanced technology, an entire ER that fits in your pocket, and she's going to become the CEO of a giant medical devices company. And she's going to advance 21st century medical technology in ways that no one ever expected. And she's going to be on the cover of Time Magazine, and no one's going to know where it all came from. (laughs) <laughs> I mean that that could definitely be something that they they do <laughs> but yeah I I do think you know, I think you're absolutely right to call out that her going to the future with her son with Rios does feel like the easy button yeah and I think it would be much more interesting and much more kind of heartbreaking to not have it go that direction and I, I think, you know, Rios having found himself as captain of the Stargazer, I don't, I don't quite know if him 
going further with this this relationship how how would that impact that you know if if, mm-hmm. if she does come to the future would she join him on the stargazer i mean you know so um I, because I don't think they would go the direction of, you know, Voyage Home, where Jillian just kind of goes off and and, right, right. and does her own thing. I, I just don't think that would be the case, because that, that would be the only reason for her to go to the future, is, is to be with him. Yeah. Well, maybe Ricardo can be the new Wesley Crusher. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as we talk well, through this... Not. <laughs> but as we talk through this, I think it actually makes sense for the story for Rios to leave her behind because the story is so much about for every character finding themselves. In this case, Rios is finding that he's quite comfortable in the 21st century. He's become a lot lighter as a person, I think, over the course of this season. But when push comes to shove, He had to go help his friends. His loyalty is there. He knows that his place is in the future. And he doesn't want to let Teresa go. But in order to follow through with his duty as a Starfleet captain and his mission to save the future, maybe he has to let her go. And once this is all over and they return to the 25th century, He's going to have to live with that memory that he met her. There was something there. He had to let her go. And he has to come to terms with that. So that all fits in well with the theme of the season. And it would make sense to me if that's what they ultimately end up doing. Well, I I think it also means that Rios may be more open to a relationship in the future. You know, I I think I think he has realized that there is something in his life to which he would like to have, which is family. I I think he actually has realized that in a way that he never thought possible, like he would love to have a family. And so, uh, you know, I'd love to see uh, that be something that we explore somewhere. Well, he did have a family of holograms. At the beginning of season one. This is so. true. This is true. <laughs> but no, it's a good point because when we first meet the character, he's very much this loner who's turned away from his past life, right? So this is a catalyst for him opening back up to that, which makes a lot of sense. Another thing to talk about before we get to the end of the story here is Elnor is back. And on the outline, I put a thousand ways to bring Elnor back. Now, I know why they're bringing him back on screen so that he can meet Rafi and we can play through all of that. But it is interesting how you kill a character at the beginning and yet you keep finding ways to bring him back, this time in the form of a mobile emitter where he's an emergency combat hologram. I actually thought this was so smart. I think what it did is it showed how smart Agnes is. Yeah, and yeah. you know, from uh, using him as the hologram because of his uh, fighting ability, there's no way anybody's going to touch him. Uh, it's it just it worked so well, and then of course, like you said, you know, we do get that moment with Rafi, and you know, she she gets a little bit of forgiveness because he tells her, "Look, I do remember the last moments of." Elmore and all he felt was love for you. And I think that's a really important thing. Um you, you know, especially for that character who was feeling like she had been the cause of his death. Yeah. yeah. And I think what he was saying to her is is no, I ended up making my own choices. I wanted to be here. And I, I think that's great. Storytelling for the character of Rafi and 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 leading her to that point, I I really appreciated them doing such a good job with that, and it was just fun to have him back. I I do like him as a character, and I I just also love the moment where he is looking for a weapon, 
and he pulls out the sword and he's like, oh, this is it. <laughs> it <laughs> right. was great. Yeah. Uh, and then just to watch him like beat people up, you know, and it was phenomenal uh, because he's he's an excellent fighter. So I thought that this was a really smart story choice all around. So uh, very well done on their part, I think. Well, as you just pointed out, it gives closure to Rafi because she didn't get that closure from her son in the way that she needed and which is one reason she felt so guilty about Elnor because now she let someone else down and so having that closure for her is very important but so many people get closure to some extent in this episode Picard does Raffi does Seven does in a sense the Borg Queen does Agnes does uh, Agnes even makes a comment that or the Queen Agnes makes the comment that I feel like we're becoming something new Right. So it's sort of closure for both of those characters as they grow into a new person together. So, yeah, it makes sense in that case. And we, we see so many of those storylines coming to closure here to set up the finale. Yeah. And I mean, I, we didn't talk about it too much, but I loved Seven saying, I'm me. Yeah. And the, the whole... Uh, I thought that was a great storyline with her because Rafi reminding us, I think if you just stop fighting it and just accepted who you are, mm -hmm. you could be amazing. And I think we actually saw that this entire season. Yeah. That if if when Seven kind of accepted who she was and, and the, the freedom that she felt from the Borg implants – allowed her ex to accept herself in a way that she uh, hadn't before. But she can still do that because she is who she is. She's me, you know? Like, I, I think uh, that that's a really important thing. Uh, it's a really important storyline in, in the way in which one's acceptance of oneself is so important. And if if you reject yourself or you get down on yourself and this is something that i think we've obviously seen with seven ever since she was on voyager and so now i think she is going to be a force to be reckoned with in a really good way you know like mm -hmm. rafi talking about you know you could have been a great captain i, I would yeah. be really interested to kind of see where that goes too because i do think seven has a lot of qualities like, I mean, I, I think she was kind of channeling Janeway and Picard in this episode. So mm -hmm. it was great. I thought that was really well done. I really appreciated where they brought that storyline to. Yeah, th that was a nice use of the storytelling to fill in some blanks from the past because it goes by really quickly. It's just one or two sentences, but she does explain what happened after Voyager got back. She tried to join Starfleet and she was rejected because she was Borg and Janeway went to bat for her, but ultimately she decided to move on. And that's all stuff that wasn't clearly stated in the past, especially Janeway's role in it all. And I thought that was great. And it's also interesting because she was rejected because she was Borg. And now we have a new collective who came through a rift asking to join the Federation so now you've got an entire board collective that you would have to consider. Do you reject them because of who they are or do you accept them? So that's an interesting well, part and of the story. They're based off of seven. Right. Yeah. They're a collective of sevens, right, is the concept here. So it's an interesting little connection. And also, did you feel like when Jerry Ryan delivered that one short line that she's herself – that her inflection and her demeanor went back to seven instead of Annika that we've been watching all season. I felt like there was this tiny nuance there. Mm -hmm. I I thought so too. I, I th I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think she did a great job of, of ex it showed acceptance of herself, right? Mm -hmm. That, that there was that seven is a part of her. It is her. Mm -hmm. And, that acceptance of seven, seven part of her is, is really important. But I also think it's interesting because Annika is a part of her too. Right. So I'm interested to see moving forward 
will we see Seven integrate both parts of herself? And I think we will. I think that's part of the point yeah, of the story. Which I think story. We, it, yeah. it's going to be a really cool story. Yeah. Okay, well, last point to talk about is the ending of the episode and the Queen's message that there must be two Renees, one who lives and one who dies. What did you think of that? Where is that headed? I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I did first think of Rene Picard. Who died in the fire. Uh, who died in the fire. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. So, the name is spelled but, differently because one is yeah, feminine, yeah. one is masculine. But yeah, I had that thought. Uh, but this was something to which is a really nice final mystery for the season, to which I'm not quite sure how this is going to play out at all, which I really like. Again, I'm going to say I'm, yeah. I'm thankful that this is a part of the story that I don't have a ton of speculation on. Because it's very cryptic yeah. as a message, and I just don't know where they're going to go with it. And that's actually really exciting. Yeah. Um, it, it makes that final episode, to me, much more exciting because I'm, I'm going to be surprised. So I, did you have any thoughts, Chris, as what, you know, where you think this might go? Yeah, I don't have any definitive thought. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but I was thinking, what could this mean? And so I had some ideas. One obvious one is some sort of split in the timeline so that there is one timeline in which Rene goes on the mission. Well, first of all, I think it's important to note that the Queen said that the mission must not be postponed. So the mission has to go forward. And then she says there has to be one Rene who lives and one Rene who dies. So I imagined a split in the timeline where in both timelines, Rene goes on the mission and in one she comes back with her discovery and one she does not. Could be two timelines where Q and Soong are able to stop her in one timeline but not the other. I also thought does Soong have some kind of technology that he's been developing where he can somehow create a duplicate Rene? I don't think that's it, but I am wondering why the Soong story is part of the season, really. And maybe that would be some sort of twist to it. And then I also had the thought of, although I know he's not going to die because there's a season three coming up, does Jean-Luc need to take Rene's place on the mission somehow and then she lives and he dies but of course the timelines reset and so he doesn't really die you know that sort of thing that we've seen it feels like a Q story so anyway those are ideas that I had but no I really don't know I think a split in the timeline when makes mm -hmm. the most it's the cleanest solution to it in terms right. of Star Trek well and it also brings in you mentioned that like what and the heck happens with Q. Yeah. Here, like, how does he, how does he play in all this? Because obviously there's going to be a part and he probably will play a, a large part. I, I can't imagine he wouldn't. And so I think as we're talking, I'm, I'm just realizing, you know, even though we kind of brought a lot to a close in this episode, there are still a ton of balls in the air mm -hmm. that I'm not quite sure how they're going to land. Well, here's one more thought because of Q. So Q is dying. And I I don't feel like I did towards the beginning, but now I don't feel like the point of all of this is for Q to get Picard to do something that will therefore save Q's life. It really feels like Q is dying. And what he's looking for is redemption for everything that he's done. So he may actually find a way to allow Rene to go and survive while making it look like she didn't where he somehow takes her place. And by doing that, yes, he dies, but also because he sets 
the future back on the right course. He has redeemed all the bad things that he's done. That's that's an that's a really interesting thought, and you know I I think the idea that Q searching for redemption is is fascinating. So and in all honesty, I I just I'm really excited for this final episode, um, and I'm really interested because they've done such a good job this season. Um, they they really have, and I, you know. It's interesting because I look forward to every Thursday when the episode drops and I try to watch it as soon as I possibly can. And they just do a really, really good job. That's not something that I would have expected for this season. So, Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the fact that I can't kind of predict exactly where they're going to go is again, to me, just super exciting. So. Yeah. It's interesting that you say all of that, and I agree with you. I've been enjoying the season very much. And I say it's interesting because I see so much chatter online from people who don't like this season. They think it's terrible. They don't get it. It almost feels like they've missed the point that the season is so much about Picard himself internally and these other characters internally, and they're just Mm -hmm. really not enjoying uh, this storyline and i i don't know i find that kind of interesting too that there can be such a different take on what's happening but i think it also highlights the diversity of star trek and fandom yeah. and what people want from stories and so uh, there's plenty of star trek going yeah. around these days so there's something for everybody yeah well and i i think to me what made this show really work in this for this second season was the fact that they did that this became a very personal story for all the characters involved and the goal was you could very much tell the goal was to explore these characters and help them be better better versions of themselves finally which to me is always a really interesting and rewarding uh journey so so what's your rating for this episode? I think I would probably give this one a four. I thought it was really well done and I really very much enjoyed it. You know, I rewatched it today and I, I found it to be just as good as the first time I watched it. And I really liked the way they finally kind of brought a lot of these storylines to a close. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely excited for the final episode. So Chris, what would you rate it? Yeah. And so for you, when you say four, that's out of five, right? Because, yes, yeah. because mine are usually out of 10 random objects. <laughs> and yeah, contrary to the chatter I've been seeing where people said this episode was really quite bad. They really didn't like it. I'm sort of the opposite. I think that I think it's a tough episode. It's very heavy. The subject matter is heavy, but I think it pays off what they've been setting up all season very well. And it actually gives us something very meaningful to consider. And it gives us lessons and nudges that maybe can improve our own lives if we think about our own struggles, as we talked about earlier, you know, being able to face things like this and and not wait so long to do it. And therefore, I got to give this one eight mobile emitters. Nice. All right, everyone, we would love to hear your thoughts on hide and seek. There are many ways for you to share those with us. Perhaps the best way is to go to Facebook and join the Babel Conference. That's our closed listeners group. If you're already a member, you know what to do. But if not, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field and it should come right up. If it doesn't, just type the full name, the Babel Conference. It is a closed group, so please do answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. And there you'll find a post for this episode and you can share your comments with fellow listeners and with Matthew and me right there. You can also send us email if you prefer. Go to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Use the form you find there. Choose to send to a show and choose the artificial tango. And that will come to us by email. And of course, you can find us in social media on Twitter, 
Instagram, everywhere. Our username is Trek FM. Now, Matthew, when you're not preparing to create a new collective of your own, where can people find you? Well, that is taking a lot of time, Chris, uh, but you can find me all over the place, uh, social media wise, under the name Matt Rushing02. Uh, so, Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero. Uh, you can also find me here on the network with our whole other side of the network that doesn't have anything to do with Star Trek because there are so many fandoms we like covering, and that is the 602 Club. Uh, so, I hope you will check that out. You can also uh, find me on Literary Treks, The Orb, Warp 5. And, of course, Saddle Up. Uh, Literary Treks is about the books and the comics of Star Trek. Warp 5 is about Star Trek Enterprise. The Orb is about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And Saddle Up, Chris, we are going to be going on the journey with Strange New Worlds, which is very exciting. And then over on the Nerd Party Network, you can find me with a finished show called Owl Post I did with Drea Kaufman. We talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series one chapter at a time. And then you can find me with aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we do talk Star Wars. Chris, where people want to check you out, where can they find you? Well, of course, on the network, all the shows you just mentioned, the Orb Enterprise Saddle Up coming up soon. Also, Larry Nemechek and I do the Ready Room from time to time. There's Interphase, and I'm in many episodes of many shows in the back catalog. So just check those out if you want to hear my other thoughts on Star Trek and When I'm not doing that, I'm working on things behind the scenes for the network and, of course, my usual writing on business and culture and other topics. If you'd like to chat with me about Star Trek or whatever, you can find me on social media everywhere. My username is C. Brian Jones, letter C, and Brian with a Y. That's my username everywhere, but Twitter is where I'm most active, and I'd love to chat with you there. If you'd like to help us keep this show and all the shows that we are doing on the network going, we could definitely use your help. If you'd like to find out how to support us, how to get involved in the network, please visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to find out how. I'd like to send a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting us right now, and especially our associate producer, Cornelia Rotner. Thank you so much, Cornelia, for your support. And everyone, thank you for helping us keep the network going. We would not be here without you. Well, Matthew, we're just about a day away after we record this from finding out how this story plays out and enjoying that first mission with Captain Pike on Strange New Worlds. So I'm excited to talk about both of them with you in the days to come. Chris, definitely looking forward to it. So make it so.